let's switch this panel and then we should catch it. Good. So great to be here in the Nature Bar. Um, my name's Claire Matteson. I'm Executive Director of Engagement at the Natural History Museum, and I'm, I'm really excited, actually, to talk to three great scientists um, about the data they produce, but also the ways in which we're told today, aren't we, that it's all about the data. But where is the data? How do we see the data? Um, and so this is really how do we take the data perhaps out of those tables that scientists will pour over, or make graphs that we are confused by, and actually make it accessible to publics, to policy makers, to, to, to all sorts of different people. So we've got Will Marshall, Yedvin Damali, and Adriana De Palma. So first of all, perhaps you could just one sentence. Who are you? <laughs> Where are you from? Will? Um, I'm Will Marshall. I'm originally from the UK, but I live in the U United States in California. I build satellites doing Earth imaging. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of a small company called Planet. We have 200 satellites that image the whole Earth every single day. Naturally, it's visualizing already because it's images. <laughs> Not all of the data can be seen that way, but mm -hmm. uh, it, naturally, you can see different things around the planet. Fantastic. I'm Yervin Damali. I'm a professor of ecosystem science at Oxford University and also a trustee of the Natural History Museum. And uh, broadly, I, I work on understanding how ecosystems fit into planetary processes in the Earth system science. And just last week, I watched Dune and realized I could call myself a planetary ecologist. Yeah. And so so that, that's, that, that's my new term for myself. <laughs> Uh, I'm Adriana De Palma. I'm a senior researcher at the Natural History Museum in London. And I work bringing together hundreds of data sets from around the world to try and understand how our decisions about managing the land around us have impacted biodiversity so far and how our future decisions might impact biodiversity so we can try and make more informed choices to protect the planet. So this is all about the planet. It's about the emergency that the planet is facing from climate, from biodiversity loss. So, Will, perhaps if we can turn to you first. Perhaps you could say, what is data visualisation? You know, how do we use this as a kind of really powerful tool to communicate issues around climate, biodiversity loss? Well, we have tremendous new data sets at our fingertips. Um, at Planet, as I mentioned, we, we have 200 satellites and they image the entire Earth landmass once per day. Literally visual imagery, it's a bit like Google Maps of the satellite layer, but we do that every day. So the satellite layer you see in Google Maps is a few years old, and we do that every day and keep the whole history. So we have a stack of images documenting change, and we see a wide variety of things. This is one of our pictures in the background here, but we image all of the Earth every day, and we track changes with that. So it, it sheds light on world events. So we give you a few examples. We track deforestation uh, in 64 countries. And that's all about seeing where the, the trees, are they going down? Uh, where's the encroachment of agricultural land onto the uh, primal forest and things like that? Uh, we just released a map of all the world's coral reefs. Yeah. And you think everyone must know where the coral reefs are. It's surprising how little we knew. This is a, uh, yeah. It's actually, we classified the different types of coral reefs. You can see in the bottom right hand corner of this image here. And actually, it's not just a visual image, but the different spectral bands, we can actually tell the type of coral. And then, um, since we released this just a, a few weeks ago, um, already six countries have established green to protected areas around these coral reef systems. So it's not like they didn't know that they had coral reefs, but by mapping them, they go, okay, well, here they I've are. This is what I need to do to protect those coral reefs. So we've got powerful new data sets that enable us to change from what I would say was historically uh, uh, this data was helping us be aware of the climate and the biodiversity loss. And now we're getting data so fast that we can take action to stop it. So it's awareness to action. And that is in incredibly important as we try and address the challenges, the sort of twin challenges of the eco side, which I think is the best way of putting the biodiversity challenge, uh, because we've lost 70% of the life on the planet over the last 40 years. We need to reverse that rapidly. And the climate uh, challenge at the same time, because biodiversity and, and ecosystems, of course, do all of these uh, things of pulling down the CO2 in the atmosphere. And how, how do you decide, because you have a lot of data there for you, a lot of imagery, how do you decide what, what, what would be a strong piece of imagery, a strong, so, so in order to, you know, encourage people to think, hey, you know, I can now see this and I want to do something about it? Well, we collect millions of images a day, so it's obviously not practical for <laughs> us to literally sit by each image and, you know, pass it out, this one on email over here and this one on email over here. 
Now, what we do is we provide tools to access that data to thousands and thousands of researchers mm -hmm. in universities, to hundreds and hundreds of companies that use it for things like sustainable agriculture practices. We work with governments on tracking things like this. Mm -hmm. which what, is, what is this This one? is a, a forest it's fire. Yeah. This is over in California, where the company's based. I think this is the Dixie Fire, if I'm right. No, mm -hmm. I actually Willow. don't know which. Where is it? Willow. It's the Willow Fire. Okay, so you know we help firefighters. You can see here, we can see the edge of the fire. Mm -hmm. We can see the direction of the smoke. This helps the firefighters in real time mm -hmm. um, help with the fire, uh, fighting of those fires. But also, we, th there's another part of the imagery, which is not visual, where we can tell the amount of undergrowth. We can literally say the amount of stock of wood mm -hmm. under each area. And that helps the firefighters prevent the next mega fire by going, this is where we need to put fire lanes and so on. So we work with civil government around the planet to help with disaster response. So fires is one example, uh, floods is another example. So we've recently been working with the German government, for example, on the floods that were happening there, the largest catastrophic floods there in 60 years. And again, we're helping relief operations and then the preventative work, like how do we not ensure that we don't put buildings in the flood risk mm -hmm. zone and so on. This is a, a, a visualization of the flood. Um, uh, the imagery from our satellites. Of the so this is Germany, is it? Yeah, this is in Germany, Germany and, and, and massive areas of flooding. And again, we can help the relief operators. Which which, which uh, 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 bridges are down? Which ones are functioning? Which which uh, houses are, uh, are affected? What's the assessment of the damage by mudslides, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And so they will be able to get this real time and look at this yes, real time exactly. and react to it in yeah, real time. Yeah, that's yeah. right. If, yeah. they, if they subscribe and use our data sets. Yeah. And so you have to come to Planet and, and start using it. And we connect in with these users, whether it's governments, mm -hmm. as I said, or uh, academics or NGOs or companies. They subscribe to data feeds of their area and then they build tools on top of that that's useful for them. Mm -hmm. We have some tools in-house, like we can do machine learning on top to do change detection, so building. Uh, detection, road detection, uh, things like this. And then they might build, build other tools, like I just want to detect landslides, mm. and they build those sorts of tools on top of this. And so it's a generic interface to information about our planet to mm. help people make smarter decisions day to day uh, for whatever their end is mm. nearby. There's one exa last example in deforestation. This is 64 tropical countries where we're now tracking deforestation on a daily basis. We can just about see every tree at an individual tree level. And 40% of deforestation happens at the individual tree level because of what's called forest degradation. It's the illegal uh, deforestation. And our imagery is exactly designed to just about see an individual tree to catch that. We can actually often catch deforestation before it starts happening because we can see the illegal logging road that goes in prior to any deforestation efforts. So we help these countries, these 64 countries, uh, protect their forests. So with the, with the commitments that were made around ending deforestation, this will be the sort of tool that can be used on, a, on, a, on an actual basis in terms of holding various countries to account. Bingo. I mean, after you've set your goal, yeah. the very next thing is how do, you, how do you measure it? Where are we at? Where are we going next? Yeah. Right? And so actually the three biggest commitments that came out of COP so far, the, the, the ending deforestation by 2030, the oceans commitment and the methane reduction commitments of the EU and the US, the very next thing is how do we measure those things? Yeah. And satellite data is pretty key to measuring all of those things. So to explain the case of forestry, we're actually just launching a new fleet of satellites that will be able to do methane and CO2 point source emissions wow. detection. It's a hyperspectral set of satellites. And so that, again, is enabling real-time mm -hmm. enforcement of that. Yeah, exactly. These countries and the companies and others that are held accountable by these regulations are then, the very next step is going to be how do we measure it, where are we, where how do we ensure that we're on track and the journalists can then use it to hold them to account. And the immediacy of that, I guess, is really important as well, because you don't want to find out, you know... At the end of the year, yeah, uh, yeah. we've got yeah, a big yeah. hole in the Amazon. <laughs> no, no, that's yeah. exactly, and that's exactly where yeah. we're moving from, as I said, from awareness of these problems to yeah. action. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, Vinda, so data visualisation in biodiversity monitoring, uh, tropical forests, mm -hmm. what, what, how, how are you using it at the moment? Yeah. Well, just to step back a bit, I think uh, one of the, uh, the, the key science that underpins everything that's going on in COP and supports COP is earth system science. And uh, uh, this is science that relates local processes, whether deforestation or ecological function or biodiversity loss to planetary function. And it really emerged in the 70s, 60s, 
uh, and we can think of it, and it depends on tool that didn't exist before. And just like before, say a few centuries ago, we invented microscopes, and we were able to see things that we couldn't previously mm -hmm. see, and count the cell it's theory it's and everything. Tiny, tiny. Earth system science depend on the invention of macroscopes, yeah. things that could see scales that we can't directly perceive uh, as individuals. Mm -hmm. And the macroscopes, I think, are satellites, mm -hmm. uh, uh, computational power to make computer models, climate models, data observation networks, uh, Adriana, the data that she, she draws on there. Uh, and, and now, so I think a new one that we're just beginning to uh, get into is big data, real-time data, just lots of people's smartphones, and all this wealth of other data sets that are there, uh, that, that we're pulling together. And I think getting those together requires visualization of this huge, overwhelming, complex data. And that's where visualization is, is really, re really important. And do you, do you need to then work with other specialists? So, you know, you have the data, you're a scientist, you, you know, you've sort of thought about how do you collect the data, and then the data comes. But then, in order to then think about how then can, how can we then, we then turn this into something which, which is sort of perhaps differently meaningful for other people? Can you do that yourselves? Are you bringing other specialists into the labs? I think certainly you need to, for example, have the remote sensing and the visual specialist. But also I think uh, sometimes it's also not just about analyzing data, but also once you see data at a different scale, you mm -hmm. intellectually get that data uh, for, for the first time. And here, here's one example. So this is a, I've been working in the Amazon for the last uh, 30 years. And the, in the early 2000s, a Brazilian scientists, they've been new for a long time, deforestation was going on, but Brazilian scientists led by Britaldo Suarez Filho uh, created models of what would happen under business as usual for the Amazon. So they built a model looking at how deforestation rates are linked to distance from roads, access to markets, population size, and then projected, uh, based on road designs for the Amazon, projected what would happen by the by middle of the century, and came up with the, these maps, and they were published in Nature. And uh, it's pretty obvious science. It wasn't that complex, the actual science. But visualizing it and seeing that the Eastern Amazon, as business as usual, would turn into one huge cattle ranch, mm. had a huge mobilizing effect, mm. to the extent that uh, uh, you know, for the civil society, but also I think the Brazilian government under President Lula and, and subsequent governments were really motivated by that and drove a huge reduction in deforestation in the Amazon. So I think this is an example of how visualization of alternative futures really cascaded through into policy action. But I slightly reversed in the last few years, but hopefully I think uh, that trajectory can be resumed again. And so talk future. us a little bit about wh how, wh what is the data behind what we're seeing here. So we've, you know, we can see here that there is obviously degradation of forest areas. But so, so how, what is the data behind that? And then what happened to get to, to be able to turn it into this sort of image for people to see? So one data layer there is deforestation as mapped by Landsat, yeah. uh, by the Brazilian Space Agency. Uh, uh, so very straightforward forest, non-forest. And then there's socioeconomic data, infrastructure, uh, population density, towns, et cetera. There's nothing too complex. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think there may also be a climate element to that as well. There. And then sim the models that link every pixel and what's happening there to statistically to, to all these factors. And then you could put in future road projections that yes. were planned and then follow and that then model through. And then you future simulation. Yes. Well, let's get to that in a minute, but let's turn to Adriana. So Adriana, you've done a huge amount looking at sort of biodiversity change over time across the globe. So how are you thinking about the visualization of that, to sort of opening it up yeah. to different audiences from this enormous data set that you've got? Absolutely. I think, you know, as Yedwinda was saying, the data visualization really allows us to see things at a very different scale to what we're used to. And I think that is incredibly powerful to show people the context that they're living in. So when we show people, for instance, a global map of how the state of biodiversity has changed over time or what the state of biodiversity looks like right now. The first thing that happens is that people zoom in to where they live. They look at you know, their own reality yeah. that, that they have a frame of reference for. And then they start to compare it with other regions in the world and, and other places that they're not familiar with. And they start to link up their own actions in where they live 
to what's happening in you know, the Amazon, the deforestation, because we are driving that. So with this kind of data visualization, we're really putting things into context and showing people in a way that they can really understand that their actions in one place can affect everywhere on the globe. So what, what level, what scale? I think, are these your images coming out? So here? this is deforestation in the Amazon. So this is the kind of thing you, know, you can see from satellite imagery. We can see the trees being lost. But what we can't see from this is what the consequences of that, that deforestation is. What's happening to the biodiversity? Yeah. So what we do is take data like this that's showing us how land is changing because of our activities, and then using data from around the world on biodiversity change, we can predict, okay, so for that you know, one kilometer pixel, where we've lost our trees and we've deforested to create a new plantation or to create a cattle ranch, you know, what is the consequence for biodiversity? And so we can see things like this, where, as I say, we're not seeing deforestation anymore, we're seeing the consequence of deforestation for biodiversity. Yeah. So it's taking it that one stage further. And, and, and is it, and what are the other data sources you bring in then to kind of show from, say, you've got the deforestation, the road going through, and then that you layer in. What is the other data that you bring in to layer onto that? So for our biodiversity data, it's, you know, re we've got so many researchers all around the world who have gone out and they've sampled biodiversity in their local area, in different sites, in different land uses, under different human pressures. And each of those individual data sets gives us kind of one piece of the puzzle. And we pull in hundreds of these, and so we've got different puzzle pieces from around the world that lets us see kind of the global overall image. And we can use data science techniques to fill in the gaps in that global puzzle. And once we have a good understanding of how a change in land use, how a change in our decisions about the way we manage the land impacts biodiversity, we can essentially predict biodiversity change into the past, into the future, with different with different decisions, uh, using information on land use, projected models of, of deforestation into the future, those kinds of data sets we can pull in and link with our biodiversity. So that future look, perhaps, or perhaps all of you. So, so, how can we? How will this data visualization tool and or tools? How will we be able to use that to then actually be able to perhaps do model different scenarios and look into the future? Will, how will you be able to use your data to then kind of to say to policy makers or others, if you do this, this is what will happen? Well, before I get to that, can I just pick up on a thread? I, one of the things that I, I see coming out is that a lot of this has been democratized. Mm. It was once really just the province of, of scientists that really grappled with this data, and now it's much more democratized. Mm. Like um, she was saying that, that you know, um, and I love that. I mean, in the space sector, a few people have gone to space and actually seen this stuff and that you got that overview effect of, oh my gosh, I'm from a fragile planet, protected by a little thin. And now what we're helping is everyone to see these tools, get those mm. tools into everyone's hands so they make those micro-local decisions that actually benefit the pla planet. I mean, I do think prediction is important, although you know, the thing is that there are a lot of machine learning tools we were just chatting before the panel started about how Google is open sourcing their their a TensorFlow and other machine learning pieces. By the way, they're not open sourcing their data, they're open sourcing all their algorithms, because mm. they, they know that their data is the most valuable <laughs> bit, so we can get into that. But, but their algorithms like TensorFlow, they're now getting, adding in machine learning models, and actually, uh, sorry, predictive analytics models. So that would be, you take, you get a stack of images, like our images, yeah. and then it'll start predicting where the deforestation is gonna be. It won't be precise, but it will be a good guess yes. at where it will be, and actually, I, uh, computer vision, the area of machine learning that's dedicated to processing of images, is actually getting really good at this kind of stuff. Uh, we don't know exactly how it works, actually. That's one of the scary things about this machine learning. But it's mm. like, it is very good at that. So we do want to apply that uh, to, to these problems of prediction. But I, I think more importantly is what's happened in the past and that with the action we can take today. Mm. You don't even need to have to think about the future when you realize that 70%, roughly speaking, of all the life on the Earth has already gone in the last 40 years. I'm not exaggerating. It's 82% of wild mammals are gone in the last 40 years. 70% of fish in the 
freshwater lakes and, and rivers, 75% of insects, over half the world's coral reef systems, over half the world's forests, all in the last 40 years. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we, are, we have devastated, we haven't lost that much biodiversity yet because the number of species has not been declined that much. We are whittling away at a fast rate. So you don't actually need to look at the future. We've already exterminated 70% of the life on the planet. It is an emergency. We need to do something about it right now. And the prime drivers of that are land use change, uh, which is deforestation, mainly agriculture is spilling into forested lands, and overfishing. So the, and it's not climate, by the way, and that's a confusion that's around and about this conference. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone's going, oh, nature might be able to help us with climate. Climate is not the driving factor of, of biodiversity loss. So I just say, like, we don't need to predict the future. We, we already have the past. We already need to stop deforestation today, stop illegal uh, fishing and protect, protect those green protected areas today because we've already wiped out 70% of it and we just don't have time to predict the future and go, oh, in 2050 we need to do, already have done this. We need to stop those things we today. We need to stop them today, but, yeah. but we also need to give people a kind of sense of optimism and hope True. of what could happen, you know, of, of why it matters so yeah. much and yeah. how we can, yeah. if you like, you know, the, you know, bend the curve, reverse the trend, etc., etc. Yeah. And I guess well, some of these tools... the wicked thing is that we have these tools now yeah. to see it. And, you know, uh, look, you can blame humanity for getting us here for sure, but you can also say we've built amazing tools that enable us to get out of this. And nature is very resilient and it bounces back. We even saw that in a micro sense during COVID, right? We all locked down. Uh, there was a great cartoon, a Gary Larson cartoon. It was like in 2019, the humans looking at the animals in their cages. And then in 2020, <laughs> all the animals coming into the streets looking at the humans in their cages. And I thought it was just brilliantly depicting <laughs> what is a, bit of a, a tiny bit of the nature comeback during lockdown and I'm like okay well that's 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 great and, and in many pr real senses nature did bounce back mm -hmm. as soon as you give her the opportunity yeah and are there pitfalls to this I mean are there things we have to be wary of be careful of you're nodding there Adriana smiling knowingly I mean of course I think one of the one of the biggest advantages of all of this data visualization technology and one of the biggest disadvantages is that it gives us the ability to, instead of showing you know, numbers and equations, we're now telling stories. Mm. You know, we're showing people a narrative. And you know, that's a really powerful way to get people to engage, but it's also very dangerous because we have to be very, very careful not to force that narrative. Um, and you know, a lot of decisions go into how we display data, you know, very quietly, very, you know, very much behind the scenes. So, so for instance, if I if I wanted to show you different futures of how we're going to to interact with our planet and interact with each other, you know, a very green scenario versus you know a fossil fuel dependent, very you know regionally segregated, divisive future. There's very big differences in the way biodiversity is going to change mm -hmm. and very big regional differences in where we're going to see losses and where we're going to see gains. Now, if that's the story I want to tell you, I can very easily do that and, and you'll see you know, that in the, in the very fossil fuel dependent scenario, we're going to see really big losses concentrated in South America, Africa, India and very few gains in the rest of the world. But how I choose to decide what is a gain, what is a loss, how, how big are the potential gains and how big are the potential losses, what am I deciding is, is you know, no change. Those very small decisions could completely change that figure. It could completely change the story. So you know, we have to be very careful to, that, that even in our visualizations that our choices are based in science and we're transparent without you know, information yeah. overload. And yet, Bender. I think uh, maps are both powerful, but they can also be dangerous. And they can be quite beguiling. And the danger is that maps always have rich spatial information and detail, and we can confuse rich detail with rich information. Mm -hmm. And maps are only as good as the information that drives the, uh, the assumptions that drive whatever the data are there. So uh, too often we see all these wonderful detailed patterns and think, oh, wow, we really understand what's going on there. So I think we can. 
over-interpret maps. There's a danger of having too much confidence that we know what's going on because we can map it. Yeah. I think just, just, just on that as well, I think when people see maps, I think we're almost trained to think that a map is a representation of reality. And so we don't expect there to be uncertainty. But with the type of work that we're doing, you know, with modelling biodiversity, of course there's uncertainty because this is, this is a model. We, we don't know exactly how much biodiversity is left in that, in that cell, but this is the best information we've got. And so I think there is a danger when we're showing maps that we have to be very careful to make sure people understand that there is uncertainty. It is not the absolute truth. It's just the, the best information we have right now. Also, that there's many different ways of looking at it, right? I mean, one of the things about the overview effect that I was mentioning earlier with the astronauts go up is that they immediately go, oh, there's no political boundaries. And all they've seen all their life was a political map. Yes. And then they go up and they go, oh, that's not how it looks like, yes. <laughs> actually. I mean, you can see very few boundaries. So whatever map you put out, you don't want it to be the only map because there's so many ways of looking at the world. You know, there's how are we doing carbon, how are we doing on, you know, biodiversity of this kind of that kind, and and yeah, it's, you need that multifaceted viewpoint. Otherwise, yeah, it's a bit like GDP. If you get too caught up in one metric, yeah. you screw everything up. And as you say, it's always a, a, a level of inter somebody's interpretation on in order than what is shown, and that's I guess, I guess that's the danger that you're talking about the more you sort of put, wrap the story around it, you are putting a particular interpretation on it. And therefore that behoves very importantly back to the kind of scientists to really think carefully about what story am I trying to tell here. Yeah. Because stories can run away sometimes. And that's, yeah. that's exactly why in the, the museum's Biodiversity Trends Explorer, the approach we've taken is to be you know, very true to the data when we're representing these, these figures so that people can explore themselves, but also to make the data completely openly available so policymakers can make their own graphics. Yes. You know, we're not we're not pushing a single story, we're showing them the evidence and then they can and take they can that away. Play with it and take it away. So if, if for, for people who aren't aware of that, this is something that Adriana and others have, have recently been working on called the Biodiversity Trends Explorer, which is taking all of that data which you and your team have been collecting over the years and then actually um, sort of working with um, product, digital product designers to actually enable them policy makers to be able to explore that data themselves, as you say, looking down to country level, going back, going forward. Can I, can I ask you another, all another question about what, what where, where is this going? What's going to be, ha you know, what, what are the big trends? Where do you predict this to be going, either from a scientific perspective or in terms of, of, of other insights that it might open up for us? or even from a sort of public engagement perspective about how can we actually perhaps do more of that kind of democratizing of data, of science, so that public can actually begin to see and, and, and look for themselves and make their own decisions. Where do you, where do you see it going? Um, well, look, obviously we're getting better and better data sets and we are building the tools to make it easier and easier for smaller groups of people uh, that don't have data science PhDs yeah. uh, to get access and get value out of that data. We're also seeing news media start to really leverage that. I mean, we're in the New York Times hub. They do some incredible stuff. Yeah. Um, recently, they did this incredible visualization of how the North Koreans get oil via a series of transshipments using our data. And another set of journalists released a bunch of data, uh, they used our um, satellite data to expose a bunch of Uyghur detention camps, mm. Muslim detention camps in China. 200, we've, and they found these buildings. I mean, we're going to just see that it's also an era of true transparency uh, where governments and companies can't get away with just hiding stuff and pretending that they don't exist or yeah, deforestation yeah. because, oh, our system didn't notice that deforestation mm. when they talk in the conference of multiple countries on deforestation. They're not going to be able to say those things because there's an, a public eye to it because these data sets are becoming more and more accessible to everyone, like the New York Times, to come and have a look and dig in and say, no, that's not what's happening. I can see in the imagery that there is deforestation in your, in your country there, Mr. Environment Minister. And will we be able to take it down to that granular, granular level so that you can look at your town, your region? Is that, is that where yeah. this I is? Think, I think these are, these, are, these are tremendous data sets, partially because exactly they're giving the, both the global picture yeah. and they're super local at the same time. And so actually, yeah, you, you can see like you were saying, the first thing 
people do is they look where they are <laughs> and then they look around and, and see how they're doing compared with their neighbours. That's what we want everyone to be doing, whether it's on a, literally on a local, individual, person level with their community and their neighbouring community or a country level comparing how their country is doing to their neighbouring country at the sort of political level. So I think we'll see that in space. I mean, so basically, we're getting better data, better tools to access that data and it's bringing about democratisation of power of these data to make micro decisions to help us take care of the planet. What about you, Radvinder? Where, will, where do you see this, this going and how will it help you do better science? Well, I think I'll pick up on, on the public engagement mm. side as well because I think there's, there's a really important role there uh, and that's in moving from understanding things with your head, which is really mm. important, to understanding things with your heart. And I wanted to give a, a couple of examples uh, that are popping this up there. And this is, this is iconic. Yeah. This is Ed Hawkins' climate stripes and yeah. everybody for years has been seeing a bar, a, a, the normal bar line graph of, of temperature rising at the time. But the genius here was to convert this into something so visual uh, that's become iconic and really uh, the colours, the, the, uh, the artistic composition there, this real red zone at the end, it's in a, it, it converted data into something that's become universal and emotional and is used in so many different forums around that. And I think one of the real important things around visualisation is to work with people who understand visual cognition and, and what works in terms of art, what works in terms of getting to people's, people's emotions across. And this is a genius example. I wanted to show, uh, I popped up briefly earlier, there was a, a slightly more playful one that uh, uh, I did with a colleague, uh, uh, Ben Hennig, a few years ago. So this is a, a cartogram and uh, and what we do here is, uh, this is just simply maps of global terrestrial productivity from satellite data, but rather than just having colour representing size. what's going on, uh, the size of the pixel yeah. represents the magnitude of, of that, that process. And uh, normally, uh, Ben was an economist and we used this normally for social economic data, but here we did it for biological data. And this in January shows the productivity of the earth in January. And I love this because I'm a tropical ecologist and this shows that fundamentally in January we're a tropical planet. That's where all the biological activity of earth is going on. Brazil is the largest country on the planet. Yeah, Congo and Indonesia are up there as well. And the northern hemispheres have shriveled away to, to almost nothing. And if you switch to the next one, I think there's a, a July and we can see, uh, again, it's just a visualization. The data have been there for ages. It's just a different way of looking at it. And I think there should be a little animation in the next one. Yep, so we just do it month by month. Wow. Wow. And you get this, uh, which is the, the pulse, heartbeat. the heartbeat of the biosphere, and this sense that every year, this is the thing that powers all of life on Earth, and every, ultimately we're dependent on this. So again, turning very standard satellite data into something that hopefully just hits the emotional valve uh, cool. a bit more. It's very and cool. It, and it, it helps to almost kind of show how the Earth is alive, doesn't it? Yes, very much. It sort of is, yes. and is moving and is changing. Um, which is sometimes quite difficult to sort of see when, and particularly if you're just looking at a static map, it, it, it is static. But that 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 movement, I think, I guess, is something that will change. really re the change. I love those maps because you can you, you you can look at them as well with um, all different. Um, you can put all different sorts of um, parameters in front of you and yes. look at GDP, and you can look, and you look at the size of the world in different through through a different lens. It's incredibly powerful. Actually, change is a generic piece that comes out from these visualizations. Because again, people are used to these static maps. Yeah. You've only ever seen a static map. Yeah. Even Google Earth, that's the part of the, one of the challenges. And you don't have a time axis to it. And certainly the physical maps, you don't have a time axis to it. Um, and so, but now we're suddenly getting this time axis to it. And that you can really see one of the things that's just striking in our satellite imagery every day is that everything moves. And you just think, what? I mean, you look at the same place day in, day out. It changes. The yes. river moves. A field is harvested. Humans move vehicles, of course. But like, there's there's a lot more going on than that. And yeah, and a lot of it's driven by humans, but not all of it. It's yeah. incredible. It changing place. Yeah. And Adriana, if we think about the kind of biodiversity data, and particularly coming back to that sort of public side, but schools and children, and you know, are there ways which they can then actually begin to perhaps collect data? and do their own visualizations of that data, because you're talking about sharing data and how if you share data from one place to another, that kind of opens up different questions. Absolutely, so it's funny, I've, I've actually been talking with some people at the Natural History Museum about this, because what happens with, with our data is obviously the more data you get, 
the models change slightly and so our predictions of the world change slightly and so what I'd love to have is you know a network of schools that are collecting you know this small scale data and they put it into a single kind of portal and then they can see how adding even a small amount of data improves our understanding of everywhere you know that, that just because you're looking at a very small area in you know northeast london where i'm from that small data set is a piece of the puzzle you know that is a big contribution to our understanding of how everything works um, so yeah I'd, I'd love to do that and especially to you know get school children engaged with the more computational side of nature because you know you don't need to be a really outdoorsy type to love nature mm. and want to understand how it works you know you can come at it from this this data perspective and i think we'll have you know a greater diversity of people uh, if we if we try and encourage that approach but um, in terms of data visualizations i think one of the powerful things that we can do is try and make things a little bit more interactive so you know i created just a really simple app it wasn't particularly um <laughs> well done but you know essentially people could pick an option of how they're going to fix the planet you know are you going to move towards uh, you know a more plant-based diet are you going to protect more of our natural land and they can then see how that decision changes biodiversity in the future because I think you know, people get very overwhelmed with this problem because it's, it's just so large in scope. And so it's really easy to think, how can I possibly make a difference? But when we have these kind of interactive predictive tools um, and, you know, when we gamify things, they can see how their choice makes an impact. And, you know, so there's uh, a, new, a new app by one of the researchers at Sterling University called Power Up, where it is a, a real game and people can choose where they're going to have hydroelectric, hydroelectric power and they can see how difficult it is to balance biodiversity and energy requirements and prosperity, but they can also see that there are solutions. Yeah, yeah. I think, and I think that's something pe is what people are looking for. And of course, we've got all these apps for health. And I guess it's now how can we translate that into the kind of where it can be personalised, but it's health of the planet, not just health of you and how many steps you've done, but actually what impact is it having? How can you see that and how can you make it very real wherever you are, whoever you are? And I suppose the other thing is, is, is what this can do is it can cross language boundaries too. So you, 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 you can actually share data or share the visualisation of that data and share the story of the data without necessarily, it could be schools, it could be people, without actually having a, a language barrier. Um, and is this, is, uh, you know, I guess in the science world you do this all the time. Do you see that's, a, that's something that we could then, you know, work with technologists, work with app makers to, to actually bring this down more to the power of the people? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and how, do we, how, do we, how does that, how, how that going to happen? Who's, who's, who's going to drive it? Is it going to be the scientists driving it? Is it going to be the Googles of the world driving it? Where do we want that to be driven from? Well, where we want and where it will happen it could be two different things, um, for sure. I would say, yeah, that it probably is most likely to happen from the Googles of the world or some other sort of companies. Whether that's the right thing, I don't know. It's an interesting right. question. But I, I think that the power is that everybody has such exactly. computational power in their hands. In their hands. And, uh, and actually, and can we can maximize we that with, yeah. with the right of apps? How can we take it from, yeah. that, from that great mm -hmm. big data piece all the way through into the thing which is which and is your in your action. hand yes. and to your action yeah, yeah. And, and, are, and do you work with artists uh, is or is this something that we need to do more of i know in the in the health world and i've done a lot in the health world and a lot of work with artists to actually really sort of um illuminate some of the big challenges and and then also kind of present some of the ways in which people think about their health and their bodies you know through different artistic interpretations so is so this something totally. we need to do yeah. now? Yeah. Uh, we actually have an artist in residence program at Planet exactly for this do point. Yeah, yeah, because we think it, it, part of it is helping the public understand the data and so on. And um, going back to the astronaut overview effect analogy, uh, it's just because of uh, private space tourism. And, and I think the, 
the most important upshot of what's going on in the space renaissance, and there's quite a space renaissance happening right now, is not the billionaires going on their rockets and the, and the, and the and missions to the Mars and stuff. It's actually all the stuff that we're learning about the planet Earth with these tremendous new fleets of satellites that are helping us. It's all about data and how it helps us understand the Earth. Yeah. Um, but one of the side benefits of the billionaire space tourism is some private citizens are going up to space, and some of them are artists and musicians and, and things. I mean, we just had the actor William Shatner go up. And it was very interesting for him to hear what he said when he came back down. I think this is tremendous. There's a, there's a Japanese guy, billionaire, who's paid for a trip around the moon uh, with six of his buddies, and instead of taking his friends, he's made an open call to poets, and poets are going with him on this trip around the moon in a few years' time. So I, I can't even imagine what's going to happen when they see what the Apollo astronauts see. Instead of it being just scientists and engineers that go up there, people who can help interpret it to for everyone else's benefit. I think that's going to be really exciting. I mean, again, I don't think that's the big focus and exciting thing that's happening in space is actually what's happening with data and the other. But I think that's a great up, uh, uh, outshoot of what's happening. Yeah, I think there are huge possibilities. I think the more and more, uh, and, and the more we can get those other other eyes seeing seeing the things you're seeing, but actually seeing it through a different pair of lens and, and different eyes and interpreting it yeah. and then opening it out into the public. Mm -hmm. And have you, in, in Oxford, have you, you know, you it's a, it's a great meld of scientists, artists, social scientists, anthropologists, yes. all, all there together. Is that, is that, is that what happens? Uh, yes, uh, I think of it both nature loss, but a particularly nature recovery yeah. is, a, is a cultural phenomenon. Yeah. And we scientists only play one part of it, perhaps providing some of the information and, and data. But for people to implement it, to experience it, it it's a cultural phenomenon. So you know, we have an artist in prison program in our local woods in Whiteton. And, yeah. and there's a wonderful set of poetry come out of that and, uh, and, and artwork and, as well. And it's really important to think about how it goes, again, there's this point of going beyond the intellectual thing that perhaps scientists go on about to this emotional, cultural phenomenon that everyone just gets it because it's there. Mm -hmm. And art, uh, in all its forms and varieties, has an important part to play. To play in, uh, in bringing that audience in and then really and then in enabling them to actually think about the stories that they want yeah. to tell themselves from what they're seeing and how they're seeing it. But, but, it, but it all starts really with that data and with, but no, you know, that that data is there and how do we show it. And Adriana, in, I mean, you work in the Natural History Museum, as I know, because I work with you. Um, and so are there things that you think I in a museum, um, particularly maybe <coughs> in the Natural History Museum, in ways which we can um, perhaps work with other disciplines or displays you've seen that you think that works really well in turn trying to tell a kind of a complex, um, a complex story that, that, that's based on data? Well, I think one of the, the great advantages of working somewhere like the Natural <coughs> History Museum is that there's so many different people there working in very different areas. So, you know, previously, when we were talking about, you know, data visualization, it would have been purely up to the scientists. <laughs> you know, we would have made a, a not very attractive figure, um, but that was very informative and very scientifically accurate because that's the background we come from and that's the audience that we kind of naturally um, want to, you know, communicate with. But in somewhere like the Natural History Museum, you know, we've got people who are experts in, you know, user friendliness of, of these apps and, you know, graphic designers that, you know, take our ideas and, and talk about it with us and, you know, think about how accessible it is and, and you know who it's actually going to inform and how engaging it's going to be. So that's one of the, the great advantages of working there that we can work with developers and graphic designers and, and people like that. But uh, yeah, I'd love to, to work with some artists as well to, to kind of communicate the diversity of life and how it's changing. So we have one minute left. Any final thoughts on hopes and fears for getting our data out into the world so it can make an impact? I think we're, and we're in the midst of a big data revolution, yeah. and I think there's whole new exciting ways to, to visualize data emerging. And I think also I really like the fact that we're going moving to a nature recovery agenda while yeah. still needing to protect um, the stop the decline. And I think that there's a real potential for engaging emotionally with people there yeah. uh, that we can do with the data visualization. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I think... I'm still in awe about how data visualization can really 
connect us with nature, even though it's so abstract. Mm. You know, it connects us with nature and it connects us with people all over the world and, and systems all over the world. And I think that's one of the, the most powerful things because our decisions are affecting not just us, but other people as well. I'll yeah. just extend uh, what Jovinda said about the fact that the biggest agenda item here at COP is this transition to nature being part of, not just, like, it, it went from being ignored to being a central part of the solution mix. <laughs> and the very next step is all about the data and the measurement is to help, uh, to help accountability, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. And it's tremendous, it's been democratized, like we, we've been discussing, but it's, a, it's not a trivial, it's not a science matter, it's, it's literally how we're going, it's fundamental and critical for the next step of holding these countries accountable to their targets on deforestation and so on. Yeah. So motion, accountability, um, it's all about the data. Thank you so much for telling us where you are and where it's going. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing all your data in all its visualized glory um, to make sure that the, uh, the commitments made here at COP are actually held, held to over time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.